All right, here's the big one. I've recapped Steven Universe and Gravity Falls, so now it's time to take on the last of the modern cartoon's big three, Adventure Time. Yes, Adventure Time, the Cartoon Network classic about a human boy named Finn and his best friend and shape-shifting magical dog named Jake going on crazy adventures in this fantasy land called Ooh to protect the Candy Kingdom, where literally everyone is a sentient piece of candy. They all got wavy noodle arms and say crazy wacky catchphrase and the show's about war. Yeah, things get a little crazy. And there's 10 freaking seasons, man. There's tons of side stories, backstories, and extra stuff, so I might have to over, oversimplify this one a bit. But before we get started, I will say, if you like this video and wanna see more, be sure to head down and hit that big red subscribe button and the little bell next to it to make sure you never miss any future uploads. Literally no time to waste on this one, so let's start with season one. Does anything happen in season one? I mean, we got Finn and Jake partying, having fun, goofing around, and going on random adventures. They protect Princess Bubblegum, the leader of the Candy Kingdom and creator of all the candy people, from the Ice King, an evil princess-obsessed wizard who is kinda too stupid to be a real threat, but he just keeps popping up. Finn and Jake live in a treehouse with a sentient Game Boy named Beemo, Jake's date in a rainbow unicorn named Lady Rainicorn, etc, etc, etc. And all that is super fun and charming, but plot-wise, this season's pretty barren. Early Adventure Time is just pure shenanigans. And season two is mostly the same, but some wheels do start turning. See, when you watch the show, you might notice that Finn's kinda the only human around. And maybe this super buff girl he's friends with Susan Strong, but uh, that's for later. You might also spot a lot of weirdly modern technology just rotting away in this fantasy land. Like TVs and cars and... Oh. Oh! Yeah, so here's the thing. Adventure Time actually takes place on a post-apocalyptic Earth, 1,000 years after this intense nuclear conflict called the Mushroom Wars. And that war is super important. It actually provides a lot of context for Adventure Time's insanity. Case in point, Ice King. Way back, before all the magic and nuclear explosions and junk, the world was pretty much the way it is now, and we got this guy named Simon. Super smart, scholarly dude who studied antiques and lived with his fiancée Betty, who he called his princess. But one day, he finds a crown. This thing was actually made millions of years ago by an ice elemental called Evergreen to grant a wish to whoever first wore it. First person to wear it just happened to wish to become an ice elemental like Evergreen. Couldn't have wished for a sandwich or something. So when Simon puts on the crown, it starts messing with his mind and giving him ice powers. He ends up scaring off Betty and never seeing her again. So he dedicates the rest of his life to studying the crown, with it slowly changing him the more he wears it. And after the bombs dropped, Simon was wearing the crown more and more to keep himself and this random little vampire girl named Marceline safe in the post-apocalyptic wasteland. So inevitably, the crown overtakes Simon and he goes goes full Ice King, completely forgetting everything about his own life, running off on his own, leaving Marceline behind, and spending the rest of his days kidnapping princesses. Oh! I get it now. This was heavy! We don't find any of this out until season three, and it's pretty much the first time Adventure Time really dove deep into character development. And considering the rest of the show was this... <laughs> Yeah! It hit pretty hard. But that's not even the worst thing to come out of the Mushroom Wars. Nah, that would be the Lich. This ready for picture day looker is a being of ultimate unstoppable evil that Princess Bubblegum it keeps in her attic. She's managed to contain him for a while, but just when she decides to show him to Finn and Jake, he escapes. You need better security than just tree sap, Bubblegum. You're better than that. And of course, then the Ice King kidnaps PB again. This is a good day. Finn gives the Lich a good beatdown, and I'm sure that will be the only time in this entire series that he ever has to defeat him. Oh, wait, spoke too soon. The Lich is now inside Princess Bubblegum, and she's turning into a giant monster. Finn and Jake team up with the Ice King to freeze her. She falls over, breaks into a bunch of pieces, and the doctors couldn't find all the gum to bring her back to normal, so now she's... younger? 
Is that how that works? Like if I lose an arm, does that mean I'm like five years younger? But this is actually pretty interesting because Finn's been crushing on bubblegum this whole show and now they're the same age. There was like a five year age gap between them, but actually not because bubblegum's like 900 years old, but we don't know that at the time. So for all we know, they're the same age. So this could be a really interesting exploration of their friendship dynamic and how this changes things between them. But no, we don't see PB again for like six episodes, at which point she is immediately returned back to normal. Yep. So right when Finn finally had a chance to, well, have a chance with bubblegum, it's tossed out the window like that. And Finn, uh, he doesn't take it well. Dude goes all emo, wallowing in sadness and cuddling a lock of PB's hair. You know, like a normal person. Dude, she's not dead, she's just too old for you. But then he falls in love with another girl, Flame Princess, in like five seconds and starts literally chasing after her. You know, like a normal person. But despite that, Finn and Flame Princess actually start hanging out and eventually dating for a while. Until Finn screws it all up and gets his butt dumped. And if things weren't bad enough for our slightly problematic hero, Finn's starting to have freaky premonition dreams about the Lich. And wouldn't you know it, that dang old Lich is back. He uses the dead body of Finn's childhood hero to trick Finn into opening a portal to the Time Room. That is an actual sentence that I wrote into a script and said out loud. In the Time Room. You can make one wish that creates an alternate dimension wish reality. The Lich uses his wish wish to extinguish all life, but Finn jumps in right behind him and wishes that the Lich never existed. And instead of creating a paradox that explodes the universe, it instead creates a separate reality where magic doesn't exist except for the crown, I guess. Finn's now a normal human boy with a nose and a robot arm. Standard human boy fare, and Jake is just a dog. They're living on a farm with an actual human family. This is so normal that it's weird. There's this whole ordeal where the Ice King sacrificed himself to freeze the bomb that caused the apocalypse. And with Simon dead, the crown was just like, ugh, this sucks, I'm bored, and plunged the earth into a 400 year ice age. And now, after the world went back to normal, that warhead just kinda sits there, still frozen and ready to go off any day. But Finn just sees the crown and is like, ooh, yoink. Big old dummy puts on the crown and just, Finn goes nuts and starts throwing ice everywhere. The commotion cracks the frozen warhead and what time is it? Apocalypse time. Oh, well, crap. Oh wait, there's Jake. You know, maybe this ain't all bad. Oh my God, Jake's got a lich up in him. This looks like the end for Finn and Jake. But then we cut to our Jake still chilling in the time room just watching it all go down. It's a good use of time, my friend. Oh, that's right, Jake can still make a wish to fix all this. He wishes to change the Lich's wish to, I wish for Finn and Jake to be back home safe in Ooh. Huh, that was way easier than I thought it would be. But wait, does that whole farm world dimension still exist? Uh, what about the Lich? They didn't kill him or anything. He's still out there. What are they gonna do about <gasps> Look, puppies! Jake and Lady Rainicorn had puppies! They grow up by the end of the first episode and don't really play into the plot after that, but puppies! Oh, uh, and Finn broke his sword. Now he's got a new one. A fancy one that's made out of grass, attached to his arm at all times, and is apparently cursed. I'm sure there's no reason to look into that anymore right now. So let's see what's going on with the Ice King. Wait, what? So one day, Ice King got hit with a wave of some kind of anti-magic, reverting him back into Simon. And while he's come to his senses, he opens up a time portal so he can say goodbye to Betty. But Betty pulls a galaxy brain move and just jumps through the time portal. Yeah! Poop. Betty runs off to try and find a way to reverse whatever magic is keeping Ice King all Dumbo in the brain and bring back Simon. So in the meantime, jumping back to Finn, dude gets a massive drama bomb dropped on him when he finds out that his dad is still alive and in some giant space prison called the Citadel. Finn and Jake hop over there immediately, but because nothing is ever easy, the Lich goes too. He starts using goopy gray gunk to free all the prisoners, including this human guy named Mark. Martin. That's Finn's dad, and he's a total bum. The Lich starts closing in on Finn as Martin bails to try to escape. But Finn douses the Lich with this weird regeneration juice that turns the Lich into a giant baby? That's a, 
That's pretty weird. But no time for that right now, Finn's dad's about to get away. Finn tries to pull down the big rock Martin's escaping on, but he just isn't strong enough. But then his cursed grass sword randomly switches into maximum overdrive to try and help Finn and... Oh God! Finn's arm popped off. Aw, and it sprouted a cute little flower. But also, ah! Well, that could have gone better. Finn and Jake head back to Ooh, leave the giant harmless baby lich on some old couple's doorstep, and things go back to normal for a bit. Er, well, as normal as things can be when you've lost an arm. Eh, don't worry. A bee voiced by Chloe from Life is Strange falls in love with Finn's weird arm flower, and somehow that makes it turn into a tree, explode, and then turn into a fresh new arm for Finn with a little thorn sticking out of the palm. I don't know how any of this works. Hey, wait, who's that over there? Oh, right, Betty! Forgot she was a thing. She's working with this guy named Magic Man now. Magic Man is a jerk. He turned Finn into a giant foot back in season one, so you can tell he's pretty messed up. Also, he's apparently from Mars, so there's that. But when their experiment goes wrong, Betty winds up absorbing all of Magic Man's powers, as well as his jerkiness. Making Betty crazy and magical, and making Magic Man just normal man. Dude just kind of dips back to Mars after that. Gee, that sucks. Hey, what's going on in the Ice Kingdom? Well, Ice King's just kind of chilling with his penguins, including his favorite, Gunter. Gunter. Gunther. They say it a bunch of different ways in the show, and I don't know which one's the right one. Aw, look how cute he is. You would never even guess that he's actually an ancient cosmic entity called the Orgalorg, who was banished to Earth for attempting to take over the solar system by consuming the power of a comet that was barreling towards the planet. Yeah. And hey, there just so happens to be another comet barreling towards Earth right now! So the Orgalorg takes over Gunter and springs into space to try for a do-over. But Finn goes right up after him, only to find... his dad? In the mouth of a giant moth. It makes a bit more sense when you watch the whole show. Like I said, I'm kinda having to oversimplify things here for the sake of time. So Finn and Martin wander space for a bit until they find the Orgalorg chowing down on a comet. Finn jumps inside the Orgalorg's mouth, the thorn in his arm sprouts into a giant grass tentacle, and he absolutely wrecks the Orgalorg. But uh, then the comet breaks open and reveals some other kind of cosmic entity, and they're like, Finn. You were a comet once, I guess. You lived many lives over millions of years. You created me. Or maybe you didn't, I don't know. Hey, you wanna hang? Just you and me. We can travel to the end and beginning of all things together. Or I guess you can stay on Earth and do Earth junk, if you want. Finn's like, Earth junk, please. But Martin decides to take the comet up on their deal. So, Martin doesn't exist anymore. And that's the end of season six. What the heck did I just watch? That was the weirdest season finale I've ever seen. That was weirder to me than Weird Mageddon, the finale that was meant to be as weird as it could be. The first time I saw this, it went in my head, but all I processed was... Anyway, now it's season seven, and everyone starts calling Princess Bubblegum by her real name for some reason. Her name is Bonnabelle, or Bonnie for short. They revealed this name in season two, I see. But now it's becoming a pretty regular thing, so I'ma do the same thing in my video. One day, Bonnie's just chilling in this cabin she grew up in when Marceline, that vampire girl Simon protected back during the Mushroom Wars, literally bursts in and asks Bonnie to make her not a vampire anymore. We've seen Marceline countless times in the series at this point. She's a vampire, but she's not evil. She's friends with Finn and Jake. She plays bass. She's a fan favorite. She just hasn't been super plot relevant till now. But trust me, her wanting to not be a vampire anymore is a big deal. So Bonnie tosses Marceline into this machine and zaps all the vampire out of her. But that wakes up a bunch of evil vampires that Marceline had slain years before. So Marcy and Bonnie, and Finn and Jake, take out all the vampires before they can cause trouble. Bonnabelle and Marceline have a lot of really cute bonding moments, heavily implying that they got a bit of a past. And after doing a bunch of slaying, all the vampires are gone. Well, except Marceline. By slaying all the vampires, she absorbed their powers, which means she's back to the way she started. But eh, she's cool with it now. Glad we went through all that then. So we've kind of danced around this for a while now, but what the heck is going on with the whole grass sword thing? Okay, so after Finn got his new arm, he started using this new sword that had some kind of sentient Finn consciousness inside it. It's called the Finn Sword. But when someone steals Finn's Finn Sword, making Finn's Finn arms sprout Finn's Finn grass sword again, he accidentally breaks both of them. And that makes Finn 
big sad. And it makes the consciousness of the two swords meld together. Fast forward a bit and Finn is getting into a huge fight with Susan Strong, remember her? Well now she's not only confirmed to be human, but we even find out she's got some kind of funky mods installed in her head that are making her go crazy. She beats Finn up and throws him to the ground, but Finn's arm is just like, oh, heck no, you do not mess with my rest of me like that. And that big grass tentacle sprouts again, knocks Susan on her butt, and then totally ditches Finn's arm to go grab Finn's discarded Finn sword. This boy cannot keep an arm to save his life. The two swords merge together and create Fern, a sentient grass dude who is convinced he's Finn. Dude's got a lot of issues to work out, so he rides off into the sunset for a while, but don't worry. He'll be back. In the meantime, Bubblegum gives Finn this fresh new high-tech robot arm that has a bunch of different features and abilities. Remember that. And speaking of robots, this giant stingray robot randomly just showed up on Ooh looking for Susan, but it also recognizes Finn for some reason. Obviously, this is suspicious as but So Finn, Jake, and Susan all set off to find where this weird stingray ship came from. They end up on this super fancy high-tech island where they find, whoa! That's a humans. That's a veritable baker's dozen of humans. And why does that one look so much like Finn? Well, funny you should ask. Me, because that is Dr. Minerva, Finn's mom. Oh, okay. You're just gonna drop that one on us like that, all right. Minerva's lived on this island her whole life. This is where she fell in love with Martin and had Finn before a series of unfortunate events led to Martin running away from people trying to hurt him, leaving Finn on a raft in the middle of the ocean while trying to protect him, and Minerva being left on the island by herself with no idea what even happened. These days, the real Minerva's not really around anymore because she put herself in cryostasis and uploaded her consciousness to a ton of robot clones so she could help protect her people from a deadly virus that spread across the island, wiped out all their health workers, and couldn't be stopped by quarantining. Okay, this just crossed the line into official too real territory, and I am not okay with that. But yeah, now Finn's mom is a consciousness spread across a ton of robots to keep the humans safe. And now that her son's come back to her, she will not let him leave. But Finn's like, yo, that mess is dumb and stupid and wrong. Minerva's like, yeah, you're probably right. And then they leave. Oh, except Susan. This island's actually where she grew up, so she meets up with an old friend and they head off to have new adventures. Oh, and her real name's apparently Kara. We don't really see her again after that, so Finn and Jake say their goodbyes and head back to Ooh, randomly picking up this vial of nightmare juice from a dream demon on the way back. I know that's a little out of nowhere, but trust me, it's important. The guys get back home just in time for season nine. We're in the home stretch here, people. And good thing too, cause my brain is mushing out on me, which is appropriate. Cause while Finn and Jake were gone, Ooh totally mushed out on them. Place is a mess. Apparently this ice elemental patient St. Pym used Betty's newfound crazy magic to cast a mega spell that made the other elementals go crazy and corrupted all of Ooh, splitting it into four sections, fire, ice, candy, and Slime. Betty tells Finn that they can reverse the corruption if they get all the royal elemental jewels. But once he does, Betty just yoinks him and bails. Ah, poop. Yeah, Betty doesn't really give a crap about anything other than Ice King, so she tricked Finn into bringing her the jewels so she could run more experiments to bring back Simon. But you know that Ice King. He's dumb. Dude doesn't even register what's going on and messes up her whole experiment, blowing her up in the process. Don't worry, she's fine. She's just on Mars now. It makes sense. Ice King brings the jewels back to Finn, who's hanging out with Lumpy Space Princess. Now, Lumpy's been a fan favorite recurring character since season one, but she's never really been super plot relevant. Not until now. See, LSP here is actually immune to the corruption that's messing with Ooh and its people. So with all the jewels in hand, Lumpy Space Princess suction cups herself to the ground and runs a full system reset, turning everything back to normal. Hooray! LSP served a purpose, but things in Ooh don't stay good for very long. Fern starts having a total existential crisis and goes a little bit crazy. Apparently, this magic grass dude randomly developed the power to cloak himself to look exactly like the real Finn. So he attacks real Finn and tries to kill him so he can take his place. You know, like a normal person. Finn obviously doesn't want to hurt him, but he accidentally activates one of his robot arm special abilities that 
completely mulches Fern. So he's dead, and as you might expect, accidentally murdering someone who looks exactly like you is just a wee bit traumatizing. So as we enter Adventure Time's 10th and final season, that whole ordeal is weighing really heavily on Finn. That is until, oops, Fern's back, and now he's tall. And he's got friends. Friends that look like they could be Princess Bubblegum's family or something. Well, that's because they are. These are the Bubblegums. I don't know if that's their official collective name, but that's what I'm gonna call them. There's Cousin Chicle, Aunt Lolly, and Uncle Gumball... Duh. Save that one. Princess Bubblegum created them when she was little, and things were pretty chill at first. But little did Bonnie know, her family was secretly conspiring against her. Bonnie was like, ain't all this candy nature dope? Let's plant trees. But Gumball was like, money. He wanted to build apartment buildings and sell merch and stuff, and wanted Bonnie to stop standing in his way. So he created this goop that would turn Bonnie into a big old dum-dum, and the whole family was in on it. That is, until Gumball tricks the other two into taking the dum-dum juice, and they got turned into... Oh, wait, those are... those are candy people. We've seen those guys tons of times this whole show. Oh, this just got way darker, dude. Luckily, Bonnie manages to use the Dum Dum Juice on Gumbald and save herself. And that's pretty much how the Candy Kingdom got started. But here's the thing. When Lumpy Space Princess reset Ooh in Season 9, she also reset these candy people back to their original forms the Bubblegums. And they want revenge. Okay, this is getting serious. Like, Big serious. Bonnabelle and Gumbald are prepared to go to full on war with each other. The troops meet on the battlefield and stuff's about to go down. But then Jake jumps in with the nightmare juice, how convenient that they just happened to get that right before a war, and everyone gets knocked out into a dream state where they work out their differences. Finn and Fern are cool now, and PB and Gumbald decide to call a truce. Except he was actually gonna double cross her anyway, so Aunt Lolly jumped in and dum dumbed him. That is a very perceptive piece of gum. Oh, and Fern's dying. Yeah, they like killed the grass demon thing inside him during the dream, and that's made his body unstable somehow, and now he's withering away. I don't know. Show's weird. But yeah, looks like the war's off. Seems like a pretty anticlimactic ending. Oh, crap. So? This is Golb. He's an ancient giant demon baby of chaos summoned by Betty and Normal Man as part of Betty's plans to bring back Simon. And Golb is just wrecking the place. Ice King goes over to Betty and makes her experiment blow up. Yeah, again, classic Ice King. But then Golb full on swallows Finn, Betty, and Ice King and starts digesting them in his stomach. And I don't mean digesting like with stomach acid, I mean they are being broken down to their essential forms. Which is kind of just a convenient way to have the crown reset set and have Ice King turn back into Simon permanently. Which is nice, but that reunion is short-lived because the walls start closing in. They're gonna get smashed, dude. Meanwhile, everyone else is still fighting Golb's monsters. Bubblegum gets full-on crushed, and Marceline, who I forgot to mention is also there, panics. But when she realizes Bonnie's okay, she rushes over to hug her and... <gasps> Aww, they kiss. That's so sweet. Oh, and I guess Finn's gonna die, or whatever. In classic Cartoon Network style, everyone starts singing to solve their problems. And Golb hates their song so much that his stomach starts opening up, letting Simon and Finn escape. Betty stays behind and uses the newly reset crown to wish that she would become Golb herself so that she can leave Ooh, sacrificing herself to keep Simon safe. And with that, it's all over. Not everyone made it out alive in the end, but the fighting is over. And so is Adventure Time. We get a really amazing montage of everyone's lives after the war and a glimpse into the future of Ooh, but yeah. After all this, that is the story of Adventure Time from beginning to end. Okay, hear me out. Or what if we announce four brand new specials only a year after the finale? And thus, Adventure Time Distant Lands was born. A series of four original and mostly unconnected Adventure Time specials released on HBO Max over the last year. And considering I've already done a big ol' recap of all ten Adventure Time seasons, it only makes sense to hop back into Adventure Time for a bit to talk Distant Lands. This is everything you need to know about Adventure Time Distant Lands. As usual, a lot of things will have to be oversimplified here because there's a lot to get through. So this whole shebang starts with Bimo, the sentient Game Boy that lives with Finn and Jake, in their first special, 
BMO. We start with BMO out in outer space, flying around and singing about starting a potato farm on Mars. Yeah. This is adventure time, all right. But then they're thrown way off course and crash land on a mysterious space station called the Drift. And this place is in pretty bad shape, but no time to think about that now. Look, conflict! Some aliens are fighting over a glowy green thing, but Bemo's ship crashes on top of it, and that takes care of that. Naturally, they all get a little ticked at Bemo and chase after him. But then, swoop! Bemo is saved by this bunny girl named Y5. She's a scavenger on the Drift, looking for useful tech to bring to some guy named Hugo. Bemo sparks some interest around the Drift after helping stop a breach in its hull, and soon, Y5 and Bemo are met by this super shady looking guy named Mr. M, who I'm like 99.99% .99 sure is Finn's dad, Martin. We never see his face or anything, but I mean, Martin, Mr. M, they got the same voice actor. Yeah, uh, theory confirmed. And knowing that, we know that Mr. M here can't be trusted. But the gang doesn't know that, so they follow him to this giant super gumball thing called the Unity Pod. And inside the pod is Hugo, an alien elf scientist man who seems to be the leader of this whole place and the one in charge of building the Unity Pod, which he claims will fix all the problems with the drift. Breaches and malfunctions have been happening all over the place, so they gotta try and make them not happen. But the pod is missing one last piece called a Genesis Crystal, which is trapped in a super dangerous part of the drift called the Jungle Pod. But Bemo B and Bemo, they're just like, I can do it, just tell me who I need to kill. And Hugo's like, all right. So Bemo hops over to the jungle pod with Mr. M, grabs the Genesis crystal, and experiences instant regret as the entire pod is thrown into chaos and the plants start chasing after them. Mr. M makes off with the crystal, traps Bemo inside the pod, and Bemo dies. Some of the angry plants attack and break them into a million pieces. So Bemo's dead. Back at the Unity Pod, Y5 discovers that Mr. M has been secretly surveying the entire drift, looking for parts to salvage for the Unity Pod. And every time something gets salvaged, its pod fails and shuts down. That's why the malfunctions and breaches have been happening. Building the Unity Pod is actively killing the drift. And that's a bad thing. Y5 is like, uh... <laughs> she rushes off to get BMO, finding their... A corpse? Does this count as a corpse? Anyway, Y5 takes BMO to get fixed up by, oh, another BMO bot, huh. So yeah, this is Seago, a way older bot very similar to BMO who was actually created by Hugo. And they're like, Hugo? Oh yeah, that guy sucks. And that Unity Pod is just his ticket to ditch this place and leave you losers behind. So yeah. That's bad. But hey, Bemo's back together. That's a silver lining. So the gang runs back to the Unity Pod to expose Hugo for the fraud he is. And give the guy credit, he comes clean pretty easily. He's like, <laughs> yeah, I totally just built this thing so I can zap all your power and bounce. And now that Mr. M's given him the Genesis Crystal, Hugo starts up the pod, hops inside, and smashes the controls. What are we gonna do? Well, Bemo's like, why don't we all just unplug the pod and chuck it into space before it can zap the power? And everyone else is just like, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, so they do that. Hooray! The drift is saved and Hugo and Mr. M are aimlessly floating through space. And with that, it's time for BMO to mosey on. They set back off into space and fly to, oh, Earth, where they meet a little human boy in a stupid hat and a magic yellow dog. Surprise, this was a prequel the whole time. And that's BMO. One special down, three to go. Next up, Obsidian. We start this one in a new location for the series, as far as I can remember, leave me alone. The Glass Kingdom. A long time ago, this place was attacked by a giant dragon called Moto Larvo, but was saved by our favorite vampire demon bassist, Marceline the Vampire Queen. She sang a song and the dragon backed off, retiring inside a mountain called the Furnace, a place where glass citizens used to go to fix themselves when they got cracked. Flash forward many, many, many years later, and a young glass boy sneaks into the furnace to try and fix a crack in his head that everyone makes fun of him for. And naturally, stumbling into the resting place of the dragon that nearly wiped out your entire civilization, is a bad idea. Glass Boy accidentally wakes up Moto Larvo, putting the entire Glass Kingdom in immediate terrible danger. So to make up for dooming his people, Glass Boy sets off to find Marceline, who's been living a pretty chill, normal life with her girlfriend, Princess Bubblegum. Yeah, so I know the last special was a prequel, but we're off into sequel town now. Glass Boy makes it to Marceline's house and is like, help, but Marceline and Bubblegum are actually kinda hesitant to say yes. Glass Boy's just like, come on, 
Seriously? So it's off to the Glass Kingdom. Cut to the furnace where Marcy reprises her old song, and it's a diss track at Bubblegum. Yeah, so the song Marceline played all those years ago came from an argument between her and Bubblegum, and that became the day they first broke up way back when. So this is more than a little awkward. And worst of all, it don't work! So out of nowhere, Bubblegum calls in a surprise, surprise giant, giant bird who drops a fancy force field machine down that manages to keep Molto Larvo inside the furnace for now. Basically, Bubblegum had a secret plan B this whole time in case Marceline failed, which is also more than a little awkward and leads to another argument. Bubblegum's plans fall through and Molto Larvo is now loose in the city. Things are going really well. Glass Boy lures the dragon into the furnace, Marcy and PB chase after him, and a malfunction with the force field caused by these three characters who are lame, so I don't wanna talk about them, all leads to Glass Boy, Marceline, and Bubblegum getting trapped inside the furnace. The dragon is stuck under some rubble for now, so with what little time they have left, Marceline and Bubblegum make up, and Marcy sings a really sweet love song. A song that causes Molto Larvo to get all introspective. Apparently, they used to be this cute little fish thing that went into hiding after being attacked and nearly killed. They covered up their scar with a shell and over the years grew old and angry. But after hearing Marceline's song, they remove the shell, the scar starts glowing, and then they, uh, they break open and turn into a glowing cat Butterfly? How many animals is this thing? So the dragon's not a threat anymore. Marcy, Bubblegum, and Glass Boy manage to escape from the furnace. And that's basically it. Next special, Wizard City. Okay, so for this one, we gotta start with the character I kinda glossed over in my first recap, Peppermint Butler. Long running character in the show, Princess Bubblegum's butler, also an avid user of dark magic. Near the end of the original series, he came into contact with Dum Dum Juice, the stuff made by Bubblegum's evil uncle Gumball that turns anyone it touches into a harmless, stupid candy person. So when Peppermint Butler got doused with it, he reverted back to a stupid little baby mint. Now, many years later, baby Peppermint Boy is trying to attend a magic school in Wizard City to learn to become a powerful dark wizard again. The only problem is, in Wizard City, dark magic is illegal. And funnily enough, a peppermint butler is also illegal in Wizard City. Yeah, apparently this dude is an infamous and feared dark wizard here, banned from ever returning. So yeah, that's not gonna make life easier for our little peppermint boy. And he's already not having the best time. He donked up his audition for magic school, only barely got accepted, he's getting bullied by these cool kids, and he got shoved into the loser house with this girl named Kadebra. Kadebra's really not interested in real magic. She prefers stage magic. Sleight of hand, the fake junk. She's also the niece of classic Adventure Time character Abraka Daniel, so that's kinda neat. But you know what's not neat? Murder. Hey, uh, Editor Fofi here. I'm about to start talking about a character named Spader, and I just realized that I called him Saber, like, the entire video. I've been editing this video for a very long time, and honestly, I don't really feel like re-recording those lines right now. So, just know, between you and me, anytime I call this guy Saber, I meant Spader. Is that okay? Cool, thanks. One night, Peppermint Boy's bully, Saber, mysteriously goes missing and is thought to be dead. And Saber's friend, Blaine, starts suspecting Peppermint Boy might have had something to do with it. You know, what with his poor relationship with Saber, his use of dark magic, and the fact that a ghostly apparition of the real Peppermint Butler barfed itself out of Peppermint Boy's mouth and told him to show Saber who's boss, loudly, in the same room as Blaine. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna raise suspicion. So Blaine starts snooping around Peppermint Boy's stuff, discovers his identity through a photo album of all things, really think he would have left that one at home, and of course, calls the cops on him. So our hero is now being arrested as the main suspect of a murder. That's always a good thing. But Peppermint Boy manages to escape the cops and runs off into hiding. Now, here's where things get weird fast. And simplifying it for this recap is only gonna make it more weird, but just stick with me here. Peppermint Boy is found by Kadebra and one of their teachers, who's like, Peppermint Boy, oh, I'm so glad you're safe. Here, follow me into this dark tomb and check out this wicked throne with a skeleton on it. Uh, okay. That's pretty out of nowhere. Also, that skeleton looks familiar. Why are people in robes emerging from the shadows? Yeah, okay, so this is the tomb of Kokontepi, the resting place of a giant cosmic entity who seems to be where all the magic and ooh came from, or something like that. The people in the robes are a bunch of teachers from the school looking to revive Kokontepi and bring about a new age of terror and dark magic. Cool! All they have to do is find a worthy host who can handle all the dark magic and power, which they've not had much luck with. But a dark wizard like Peppermint Butler would be the perfect candidate. So they give Peppermint Boy Icor. It's some gross, goopy magic junk that oozes out of Kokentepi's corpse. Apparently it contains their power. Peppermint Boy drinks it and... 
Oh my God. He morphs into this giant uncontrollable monster, kills all the teachers, <laughs> hardcore, and is about to wreak havoc all over Wizard City. But just then, Kadebra swoops in and uses her fun stage magic to distract Peppermint Monster so she can deliver one swift magic punch to the gut. Peppermint Monster barfs up the i returns to normal, and the world is saved. Yeah, there's some stuff about how Peppermint Boy doesn't want to be like Peppermint Butler, that ghost of Pep Butt that lives in his mouth evaporates into nothingness, Peppermint Boy and Kadebra are friends forever now, and that's pretty much the end of this very, very normal special. Oh, and that skeleton was definitely Saber. A child was murdered in this special. No need to address that because we've reached the final special together again. We're finally back with our favorite boys, Finn and Jake, and guess what? They're dead. Yep. Our good boy Finn has found himself in the afterlife, dead as a doornail. And despite now being one of the many, many corpses in this video, Finn is just super excited to finally meet up with Jake again in the afterlife. But instead of finding his long lost friend who passed away many years ago, Finn finds this fox dude. Ugh, okay, I know this guy's a returning character, but I can't remember his name for the life of me. Hold on. Oh. Oh, he's just called Mr. Fox. I could have guessed that. Finn's like, take me to my dog! And Mr. Fox is just like, yeah, yeah, you're gonna have to take that up with management. So Finn barges into this castle to meet with Death. But we've seen Death in Adventure Time before, and uh... Uh, this ain't them. Yeah, this is New Death, the son of Old Death who accidentally inherited the job after killing his dad. Dude killed Death. By all accounts, that should have caused a paradox that consumed all of time and space, but nah, New Death's just kind of a jerk. He thinks all this afterlife junk is stupid and is just trying to destroy it all. So, yeah. I should probably explain. The place Finn's at right now is called the Dead Worlds, a form of afterlife with 50 different levels. Level one is endless misery, and level 50 is basically nirvana. Souls can rest in their assigned dead worlds, or they can be reincarnated for another chance at life. And New Death wants to get rid of all of that. Legit, he wants the afterlife to just be the endless misery and nothing else. So Finn's gotta stop him. Well, kinda. He mainly just wants to find Jake. So he runs off and starts hopping from dead world to dead world looking for him. Apparently that dude made it all the way to dead world 50, so Finn's got a lot of searching to do. Meanwhile, New Death just keeps blowing up all the other dead worlds, but the only one he can't access is number 50. So when Finn eventually finds Jake and he descends from Nirvana, New Death just hops in and takes his opportunity to blow the place up, sending every single soul down to dead world one, the one that sucks a lot. And I mean, even for Finn and Jake, trying to take on Death himself is kind of a big ask. So things are looking pretty hopeless. That is until Jake's suggest contacting someone outside the dead worlds. And Finn's just like, you could do that this whole time? So they contact Peppermint Butler, who's looking back to his old self again. He uses magic to grant Finn and Jake temporary access to the realm of the goddess Life. Life being the person who gives souls, well, life. And she's also New Death's mom, but she's pretty uninterested in helping the crumbling dead worlds or even dealing with her son at all. That is until she learns he's trying to get rid of reincarnation. Then she gets mad. Didn't care at all until it affected affected her personally. Unbelievable. So life gives Finn and Jake a magic stick called the Kiss of Life, claiming it has the power to conquer death. Like, literally. This stick will kill her son. But uh, remember how I said New Death accidentally inherited the responsibilities of Old Death after he killed him? Yeah, whoever takes out New Death is gonna have to become New New Death. So that's gonna be a problem. But things only get worse when we discover that New Death this entire time has been puppeted by Guess who? That's right, it's the freaking Lich again. You know, the Lich, one of the main recurring villains from the show who just never quite seems to be gone for good. Yeah, him. Even in death, Finn and Jake cannot escape this guy. So now it's a final face-off between Finn and Jake and the Death Lich. Holy crap, that's a cool name. But Finn and Jake know that whichever one of them takes him out has to become the new, new death. And they start fighting each other over who's gonna sacrifice themselves. But then Mr. Fox randomly walks in, sees them arguing over the kiss of life, and just yoinks it from him. The Death Lich attacks, Mr. Fox uses the stick, bada bing, bada boom, Mr. Fox is the new, new death. And just for good measure, Jake flings what's left of the Lich out into the never-ending void. So things in the dead world can go back to normal now, and all that's left is for Finn and Jake to settle down into their dead worlds. But Finn decides he'd rather take another shot at life. He spent so much time just waiting to be with Jake again, so he wants to be reincarnated and live a new life. One where he can be more in the moment instead of just waiting to die, I guess. But Jake's like, eh. I'm just gonna come with you. They hop back into the world of the living, ready to be reincarnated, and with that, we reach the end of Finn and Jake's story. 
for real this time. And with it, the true final ending of Adventure Time. Oh, come on, there's a spin-off now?